Thank you very much and uh, welcome everyone. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, we're very uh, excited about this uh, particular webinar. This is Great Expectations. What does 2023 have in store? And this is sponsored and presented by uh, Career Builder. I want to acknowledge that Career Builder has been a longtime partner and sponsor uh, of SIA and particular, particularly of these webinars. Uh, when we first started them almost uh, 10 years ago, uh, Career Builder was one of our, our first sponsors. So, so we're, we've uh, been so glad to have them along with us uh, for this ride. Okay, um, as mentioned, uh, this WebEx is coming to you over the WebEx uh, platform. Uh, you can uh, use those uh, buttons on the lower uh, right and toggle between uh, uh, the QA and, and, the, and the chat panel. Uh, we welcome your, your questions and we'll definitely have a, a segment of time at the end of this webinar. Uh, to try and ad address some of those those questions, so uh, so don't be shy. Uh, the uh, the volume of of sound is coming through your computer, uh, so you can adjust those as well. And uh, just a word about uh, SIA. Uh, SIA is uh, the the advi the global advisor for staffing and workforce solutions. We offer a range of uh, events, research, and editorial products for staffing firms and buyers. And our members enjoy uh, objective research, event discounts, um, editorial publications, and advisory services. And um, speaking of events, our, our next event is our executive forum coming up uh, March 6th in, in Miami. Um, so um, don't, don't miss out on that. Okay, so I'm so excited to uh, introduce uh, our, our speakers today. Uh, our speakers are uh, Torsten Slock, PhD and Chief Economist at Apollo Global Management. Uh, Torsten has worked uh, for 15 years in cell-side research, where his team was uh, top-ranked by institutional investor um, for 10 years, including being the number one-ranked team in, in 2019. Uh, before that, he worked at the OECD and the, uh, the IMF. And uh, Torsten is a, a frequently appears on national media, including CNBC, Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, uh, and other uh, national media outlets. Um, thank you so much, Torsten, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Great. Uh, our other presenter is Kristen uh, Kelly, the Chief Marketing Officer uh, of Career, Career Builder. Kristen has spent uh, 20 years in the staffing industry, and she's built her reputation as a, a marketing strategy and consulting leader uh, for some of uh, the leading firms in the industry, including the Intersect Group, uh, Ronstad, and, and Higher Dynamics. And Kristen is an expert on such topics as uh, demographic workforce shifts, women in leadership, work-life balance, millennial employees, and she has a passion for sharing her, her industry knowledge uh, with others. So thank you, Kirsten, welcome. Thank you, I'm very excited to join you guys today. Awesome, okay. So on the docket today, uh, we are gonna focus a fair bit on, on the economy. Uh, and uh, a look at, at the staffing industry. So uh, I, will, I will start us out with uh, some SIA data on the staffing industry, and then we'll get into the macro economy. Then we have a special uh, segment that, that Kristen will be presenting on um, leveraging survey data that uh, Career, Career Builder uses um, to get insights on today's uh, candidate market. And lastly, we'll, we'll be trying to touch on future trends that will impact your business. And we'll kind of have those um, kind of baked into um, our, our sections as, as we talk today. Okay, so with that, uh, let's start out talking a little bit about uh, GDP, which is the, the overall measure of, of goods and services produced in the economy. Uh, and, and it's the single metric that, that kind of gives you an idea of, of how things are going in the economy. And, and uh, when it comes to the staffing industry, it's, it's pretty useful just for getting that sort of context. And as you can see here, uh, in 2020, when the pandemic hit, uh, the economy took a little bit of a dent, 
but they then came roaring back in 2021, 5.9% uh, GDP growth. Uh, that was aided by a lot of government uh, stimulus spending, uh, some, some 5 trillion of it. Uh, and uh, that allowed the, the economy to get back on, on its feet quite quickly. And then last year in 2022, GDP grew 2%, so kind of a more uh, normal year of growth last year. And so um, the, the government stimulus was, was wonderful, but it, it did contribute a bit to uh, so some of the inflation that, that we're seeing, um, and that's caused the, the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates uh, and acting as a break on the economy. And so what we are now looking at in 2023 is a bit of a slowdown. And um, a lot of question marks, which is you know probably why you've joined this webinar, um, about how will this play out this year? Um, will it be a hard landing? Will it be a soft landing? And then on to hopefully a more normal normal 2024. Uh, so, so Torsten, uh, since since we have you on this call, um, can I get your thoughts on on the GDP outlook? Yeah, no, this. Uh... I mean, I think what's very important uh, with this profile here of uh, 2023 being a little bit weaker, I think what's critical is from a planning perspective, as we think about hiring workers and as we think about our staffs, that if we have a little soft patch ahead of us with a few quarters of growth, maybe even being negative, we could even, technically speaking, be in a recession if you have two quarters where growth is negative consecutively. That would be the traditional definition of a recession. But what's important in this context here is that we're seeing companies at the moment do more labor hoarding, meaning holding on to workers. And why is there more labor hoarding? Why are companies holding on to workers? Well, for two reasons. First, because of the experience that we all went through in 2020, where a lot of people got laid off and very quickly after companies had to go out and hire a lot of those workers back and it was so difficult to hire the same workers that there was a major search for other workers that could take those jobs. So given that experience is so recent, one very important a backdrop for what we're seeing in the labor market, including the employment report last Friday, is that employers are holding on to workers because the expectation is, and this is the second argument, is that growth, when we come to the end of this year and in particular next year, is going to normalize again. So to not repeat the same mistake, uh, there is some hesitancy in terms of, well, how long will this recession be? Will it be short? Will it be a little bit longer? But the bottom line is here that uh, hiring is certainly needed because we will get growth coming back by the end of this year and going into 2024. So the labor market continues to be absolutely critical. And it, of course, is also very critical uh, as we speak here. Jay Powell is uh, talking about what this means for the Fed. And he is clearly expressing worries about that if the labor market is too overheated, if wage inflation is too high, then he may have to raise interest rates more. So... The bottom line in this important picture here is that, um, yes, there is a soft patch ahead of us here over the next several quarters. That's what also the consensus and the Fed are expecting. Uh, but at the end of this year and going into next year, we should begin to see things normalize again. And I think that's a very important context for the discussion that we're having today. Great. Thank you, Torsten. Um, that, that labor hoarding, that's an interesting term. And um, I guess that that shows why the, the initial claims are so low and, 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 the, and the jobs report hires were so high. Um, how, let me just ask you, how does that square with some of the layoffs that we've, we've seen in, in, in the headlines? Um, do you think that's just specific to um, some tech companies or, or do you see that um, spreading more broadly? Yeah, that's a very, very important issue. Uh, so think about the following, as you just mentioned, Timothy, that in 2022, the Fed raised interest rates because inflation was high and they raised interest rates quite quickly. And what has the impact been of that? Well, the impact has been that those components of GDP, those components of the economy that are sensitive to interest rates have really started slowing down. What are those components? Well, that's mainly housing. Housing is very sensitive to interest rates. Autos, the car industry is very sensitive to interest rates and durable goods, washers, dryers, furniture is also sensitive to interest rates because all those components require financing. So if the cost of capital, if the cost of borrowing goes up, you should expect to see those sectors of the economy not do very well. And what's also unique to your question is that the tech sector 
is also very vulnerable to interest rates going up because remember tech as a sector has only cash flows that are far far out in the future you invest in something today and you don't really know before many years down the road if this turned out to be a good idea or not so cash flows that have long maturities and long durations are much more sensitive to changes in the discount rate and interest rates today so that means that when interest rates went up so much in 2022 a lot of the tech companies a lot of growth companies really we're going through a quite painful period. And that's why they are now laying off workers because they simply are just more sensitive to interest rates moving higher. But those sectors that are sensitive to interest rates going up only make up roughly around 20% of GDP. 80% of GDP is services, and that's still doing well. We know that in the career builder data, we know that in all the data, when we look at the jolt state of the data for job openings, that there's still a lot of labor shortages in restaurants, in airlines, in hotels, you have a lot of also economic activity in sporting events, in concerts. We even monitor the weekly data for Broadway shows, which also is very strong. So consumer services, which makes up the vast majority of the economy, is still doing quite well. So the answer to your question is that those sectors that tend to be more sensitive to interest rates, they have seen less hiring. They have been, in some cases, also seen more layoffs. Interestingly enough, in construction, we have actually not seen layoffs but we're still seeing hiring even in the employment report that came out on friday but to your point that means that it's very sector specific and it is those sectors that are most sensitive to the fed raising interest rates where we are seeing those layoffs or that more significant weakness in the labor market whereas in the service sector and the service industry we are generally seeing very strong labor market very strong hiring more job openings the number of job openings overall in the u.s economy at the moment just went up to 11 million that is again very very high before the pandemic was running around 7 million so the conclusion is that the layoff headlines have to be viewed in the context of interest rates have gone up and it is those sectors that have been impacted by high interest rates that are seeing a higher degree of layoffs. Oh, wow. Okay, that's that's very insightful, Torsten. I was I was scribbling down notes as, as you were talking. So, uh, so so definitely some sectors impacted more than others. Um, you know, maybe for staffing firms uh, or staffing executives, they can think about their book of business and and kind of what sectors they're in. Maybe think about diversifying uh, out of some of those sectors um, if if. If, if those client sectors are going to be hit by the interest rates. Um, but uh, let's let's keep moving here. Um, so that's that's a look at GDP. Um, let's take things back to the staffing industry. And so this is where um, SIA has uh, some good data to, to share. Uh, we collect a lot of staffing firm revenue data and, and have quite a database on it. And so in terms of, you know, where is 2023 going? You know, it's, it's helpful to know where we've been. So uh, we've had a couple of years of pretty booming growth in, in 2021 and, and 2022. Um, most segments of, of staffing uh, grew double digits. And then we had portions of healthcare staffing like travel nurses that grew uh, an amazing 5x in, in market size. So it, it's been quite a lot of expansion for the staffing industry. And so things may be understandably may slow uh, growth a bit in 2023. So this is, we're looking at our, our last um, forecast analysis, which is um, September, and we'll be coming out with our next one in, in April. And, um, you know, 2% growth is is the, the estimate for 2023. Now, don't let that spook you too much. That's partly because this huge travel nurse market is, is shrinking down again. So if you took out travel nurse, it would actually be a 5% growth projection for 2023. And um, so after a couple of you know, years of double digit growth, uh, we're looking at more uh, single digit growth and even you know, pulling back in, in some, some areas as well. So um, I, I don't wanna get too far into, into the details, um, but this is from our, our forecast report. Um, I'll just comment that uh, it's really been the professional segments of staffing that have, have powered a lot of this growth. Um, IT staffing uh, grew 17% and then 16% last year. A lot of that has to do with some secular trends of uh, digitization in business and, and um, tremendous demand for, for IT staffing projects. Um, you know, cybersecurity, uh, the tech stack, um, 
and um, just the general uh, digitization of business. And then you've seen the healthcare uh, sector with, with massive growth, um, partly due to uh, the pandemic, but also due to um, sort of innovative technology in the traveler space. So more self-service automation, um, what we call platform technology has also facilitated a lot of that, that growth. And then uh, getting into um, office clerical and, and industrial staffing, uh, you had, had a pretty good 2021. Uh, things slowed a bit in 2022, um, but still kind of high single digit, uh, double digit rates. Now, so what does that mean uh, for the very near term? Uh, so we just published our, our Pulse survey. Uh, if you're a staffing executive, if you don't participate in this, we do this every other month. And um, um, highly encourage you to participate. You don't even have to be a SIA corporate member to, to participate in this survey. Uh, but looking at the revenue growth, so we do see sort of that deceleration uh, trend um, as the economy has slowed, as, as those interest rates have, have gone up, as, as we just talked about. So we're now seeing, uh, you know, office clerical industrial kind of more um, mid to low single digits. And then uh, professional staffing, maybe more high single digits. It was interesting on this particular survey that the uh, locum tenens or physician staffing um, was seeing some growth and also allied healthcare, um, seeing, seeing some pretty hot, those were some of the hotter sec sectors. Um, I'll share some public company data points uh, for Q4 as, as some of those results recently came out. Uh, so uh, True Blue's People Ready uh, division was, was down uh, 13% year over year in, in Q4. And um, I, I think we've seen that trend in, in different areas as sort of the, the seasonal ramp related to retail, uh, warehousing and distribution. Uh, that, that ramp came in a, a little bit lower for the staffing industry, uh, it, it looks like. And so that's had an impact. Um, but again, uh, you know, other areas of, of professional staffing have, have done a little bit better. Uh, Robert Half contract staffing was down 3%. Uh, in, in Q4, and, and then they also said it was down 7% in, in January so far. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, uh, K-Force IT staffing revenue was up 8.5% uh, uh, in, in Q4. So, you know, still, still pockets of, of year-over-year over year growth um, happening. So uh, that's, that's a little look at, at revenue trends, and then I will it over to Torsten uh, to talk about the, the slides that he wanted to share. Yeah, thank you, Timothy. So if we look at the first page here, yeah. the issue that I think is very important to have in mind as a backdrop for a conversation about what should we expect in the staffing industry over the coming six to 12 months is to ask the question, well, that depends on what's going on with inflation, and as a result of that, what's going on with the Federal Reserve and interest rates. In other words, is the Fed done with raising interest rates, or are they not quite done yet? And literally, Jay Powell just said right now that he expects the labor market to soften. He expects, and he has said that numerous times before, the unemployment rate to go up. And with that backdrop, if there is a softening in the labor market, the question for us in the staffing industry is to think about, okay, but will that then be a soft landing? Will it be a hard landing? In other words, will it be a quick move higher in the unemployment rate? Or will it be, which seems the most likely scenario at the moment, more a no landing where the economy, at least not yet, has been slowing down? Uh, so looking first at this picture here, uh, inflation in the blue line is the year over year inflation. And as you can see at the moment, that's a little bit less than 6%. If you look at the six months change in inflation and the three months change in inflation, that's a little bit lower. So now you could ask, well, why is that important to look at the three and six months change? Well, that's important because when you remember, when you measure inflation, inflation is measured as a 12 month window. And a 12 month window, the latest data we now have is for December. A 12 month window then includes the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And that means that it also includes a very significant spike higher in energy prices in February and March of last year. So one way to try to exclude the Russian invasion of Ukraine and what that did to commodity prices and what that did 
to inflation is to try to instead say, well, okay, now we have some more data. Why don't we just look at what happened over the last six months? Or why don't we just look at what happened over the last three months? Because that gives us maybe a more uh, contemporary picture of what's going on with inflation. And the good news, broadly speaking, is that the three months and six months change in inflation, as you can see in the chart, has been going down. Uh, the problem for the Fed is that uh, they are not done. And that's literally, again, what Jay Powell just said, that it's too early to declare victory over inflation because inflation, according to the Fed, should be two. And as you can see in this chart here, all these numbers, in particular the year or year number, are substantially higher than two. The red line is maybe getting a little bit better, but the green and the blue line are still substantially above the Fed's target. So that means that there's still a significant risk that the Fed needs to step harder on the brakes, meaning need to raise interest rates further in an attempt to get inflation to come down. And with that will often also come a weaker labor market. So if we turn to the next page, then of course, one way of looking at this is to look at, okay, so that's interesting. Maybe inflation is going to take a bit time more before it comes down. But let's look at what inflation swaps are telling us that inflation will do over the coming 12 months. And inflation swaps are very optimistic that the inflation problem will be solved very soon. As you can see in this chart here, inflation swaps are pricing that inflation by the middle of this year will be back to the Fed's 2% target. So now you could back up and say, well, wait a minute, didn't the previous chart just tell us that we're not at two? And this chart here is now telling you that we may be soon be at two. Well, that could be, but it could also be that it's going to take a longer time, in particular after the employment report we got last Friday. Remember the employment report last Friday showed you that the U.S. economy created 517,000 jobs. The unemployment rate declined to 3.4%, which is the lowest level since the 1960s. We have not had such a strong labor market as we have at the moment since the 1968-1969 data, where the unemployment rate was also at 34 So one way of looking at last Friday's employment report is that the Fed is beginning to be more worried. And again, this is literally also what Jay Powell said in Washington, D.C., about that it may take a good deal more time before inflation comes down. So there's a lot of risks still that inflation may be more sticky. And in particular, that wage inflation may be more sticky. As we all know on this call here, there has been a significant amount of labor shortages across many different industries, in particular, as I mentioned earlier, in the service sector of the economy. And those labor shortages are maybe getting a little bit better in some of the data. But it is still very, very clear that it is very difficult for companies to find workers at the moment. And that's, of course, why job openings and that's, of course, why the staffing industry is still doing so well and job openings are so high because it is very important to get the right workers and hold on to those workers and make sure that you have the right workers once inflation finally does come down to 2%. Even if this goes as quickly as this chart here is showing or according to the Fed's own forecast, it's going to take two, three years before inflation gets back to 2%. So the bottom line is that, yes, you might ask, well, why are we talking about inflation? Why is this so important? Well, it happens to be really, really important because inflation was, as you can see in this chart here, the reason why the Fed was raising interest rates so much last year. So it becomes very important for today to ask the question, well, is the Fed now done with raising interest rates? And if they are not done, because inflation is still high, well, that then increases the risk that the labor market may need to weaken a bit more, and therefore that we may need to see a higher level of the unemployment rate. We may need to see some slowing down in hiring as a result of the Fed still raising interest rates to try to solve this problem that you're seeing in this chart here. So with that, let's turn to the next page and then just take a look at, okay, so the labor market is strong. The Fed is trying to slow it down. They are succeeding slowly, but this labor market continues to be extremely tight in the words of Jay Powell, and therefore a very important backdrop for talking about what the outlook is for staffing and hiring needs. But look at now instead this chart here, which shows you now consensus expectations to GDP growth. This is now the conversation about, okay, but when the Fed started raising rates in March of 2022, if you go all the way to the left, then you began to see that growth expectations, both in the European countries that you're seeing here, but also in the US, really started coming down. 
And why did growth expectations come down? Because remember, when the Fed starts to raise interest rates, the whole idea with raising interest rates is to slow down consumer spending, slow down capex spending, slow down hiring. And as you can see, growth expectations did decline. And you can see in particular in Germany, growth expectations turned negative because the expectation was that Germany would have a recession. And there's still, in my view, a significant risk that Germany might have a recession this year. But what's noteworthy in this chart here is look at the last few weeks. In the last few weeks, you've actually begun to see growth expectations move a little bit higher. So this is, of course, good news because that means that maybe the recession risks are subsiding, as I've written here in the title. But the bad news about this in the prior context of the prior charts is that the risks are now that, well, if the economy doesn't slow down enough, that again raises the risk that inflation may turn out to be more sticky. In other words, inflation today is at six and a half. The Fed's target is that inflation should be two. So this raises the risk that if we don't get a recession and if the economy does not slow down, we may begin to see inflation be more persistent and be more sticky at, say, 4%, which again runs the risk that we will not see inflation get all the way back to 2%, which again then runs the risk that the Fed is not done with raising interest rates. And the final chart, let's just look at the next page, is of course then to look at, okay, so that's all very interesting about the labor market, but let's just step back then and ask the final question, but what about financial markets? Uh, why have financial markets rallied so much here in 2023? Why did the stock market go up so much? Why did credit spreads, both in investment grade, high yield and loans, narrow so much? Well, the answer to that is this picture here. This chart here shows you, if you look at the text below the title, the probability of a recession over the coming 12 months in the Fed's survey of professional forecasters. So the Fed carries out a survey of about 50 professional forecasters and asks them the question, what do you think is the probability of a recession over the next 12 months. And this data here, as you can see, shows you the data up to the fourth quarter of 2022. And going into this year, literally not everyone, but a lot of people were expecting a recession. As I've written in the title, this was the most anticipated recession ever. So of course, investors going into this year were underweight the S&P 500. And if you are underweight the S&P 500 and you go through week by week in January and now also in February, and the economy is still not going into recession, that means that a lot of people were caught wrong-footed in the stock market because they expected a recession and it never materialized. So as a result of that, there was a lot of people who had to take their shorts off, meaning they were betting on the stock market going down. And as we saw a short squeeze, and we saw those shorts being removed in financial markets. A lot of people, therefore, were chasing the S&P 500 and the stock market had to go higher. Not because people thought that there was stronger growth coming in the economy. Everyone expects growth to be weak, but simply because the expectation was that we would have a recession, but the recession just didn't show up yet. And as a result of that, the stock market has been going up significantly because everyone expected that it would be going down. I know this sounds a little bit weird, but nevertheless, as you can see in this chart here, if everyone expected something to happen and it didn't happen, then it's not surprising that a lot of those people then began to say, well, if it didn't happen, then maybe I should be buying stocks because maybe we're not going to get that recession. So the bottom line is combining it all together that the labor market is strong. It will probably soften a little bit as a result of the Fed still raising rates and having to raise rates more because inflation is a problem. And with the backdrop of the financial markets, it still is the case that financial markets are, of course, now experiencing a rally because we are just not yet seeing that recession that everyone has talked so much about. And the employment report last Friday it just confirms even further that the recession is not anywhere near where we are at the moment. So for now, it still looks like the risk is that inflation will be a bit more sticky. It will take a little bit longer time and therefore it may require more Fed rate hikes. So therefore, the soft patch we have in the economy over the next two three quarters is probably going to be a bit more bumpy also for financial markets but for hiring the most important thing is again there with the labor hoarding argument that companies are holding on to workers because this is just a soft patch that will last four to six months and with the backdrop of economy and expectations to growth accelerating in the fourth quarter of this year and into next year i still think that the outlook for hiring continues to be quite strong simply because the labor market is still doing quite well and we still need to wait to see inflation come down but the slowdown we're seeing in the economy will just be temporary and on the other side we do need to make sure that we have the right staffing in place 
once we get in to the fourth quarter of this year and into 2024 because in that case you want to make sure you have the right workers and the right staffing for the economy getting back to normal as timothy's forecast also for 2024 with gdp growth of almost two percent did show so with that let me stop there timothy and turn it back to you yeah perfect thank you so much torsten uh, so now we will shift gears a little bit and uh, Kristen will be sharing uh, deep dive insights on, on the candidate. Excellent. So, uh, you know, building off of the story that Torsten started to tell, if we move to the next slide, I just want to preface that a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is the combination of some research that we did with various partners. You know, we all know the definition of research, why we do it, it's to gain the sentiments of a particular audience. In our case, with CareerBuilder, we spent a lot of time and effort last year getting, you know, inside the minds of job seekers, understanding what motivates them, what makes them stay, what makes them go, what perks rank high, um, what intangibles are important to them. So we're gonna get into a little bit of that today. But um, certainly, you know, the fact that we have this at our, our disposal to talk about means that we are going to express what job seekers are thinking, not necessarily the opinion of career builder itself. But if you go to the next slide, I think this is basically our agenda that we went through, so I won't waste time on this. But I do want to start on the next slide just talking about who is, you know, the job seeker of today. And I would say, you know, the headline of this is that most American job seekers today in one way, shape or form are seeking new or different work. This does not mean that they're seeking new or different work at a different company. It could mean that. It could mean they're looking for new or different opportunities at their own company. I think um, something behind that has been this trend that we've seen emerge out of 2022, which is, you know, this concept of upskilling and reskilling and finding jobs for people based on skills, not just necessarily, you know, the hard credentials on a resume, the concept of invisible barriers that hold people back from finding work. So there's been a lot of movement, I think, over the course of the last year. And as we go into this year, you know, that gives Americans this confidence to be able to, to look a little bit more broadly and to find a little bit of a different work than maybe they have in the past. So we can see up here, you know, 70% of people that we polled are actively engaged in a job search. 18 say they're actively looking for a new job and 26 say they would think about it, but aren't necessarily actively doing that. So based kind of on what Torsten ended with, you know, the economy, you know, is going to want to retain its workers, find great workers. So just, you know, to start this off, that is a very important point. That is a fluid job market right now. If you go to the next slide, I want to talk about how people are finding jobs. When people are thinking of actively looking for jobs or starting to passively look for them, you know, the number one thing across the board is online tools and resources. That's how people are finding work. So we can see up here job boards like Career Builder, a little plug to us, you know, do rank at the top in terms of how people find work. But there's also some pretty interesting emerging trends, even with new media out there. So you see the, the second box on here, other social media sites besides LinkedIn. I was talking with one of our staffing clients, you know, as early as like last week, and, and they were expressing that they were finding a lot of new candidates, especially in the creative skill sets, coming from places like Instagram. So there is definitely an emergence in how people are using social media. I remember when TikTok came on the scene, I thought the only thing I could do was make a video with my children, but actually it's becoming a huge avenue you know, to find jobs. So this is definitely where people are hovering today um, and where they're looking for that job seeker information. So if we go to the next slide, you know, I did mention a little bit about fluidity and I want to take just a demographic look for a moment on what I mean by that. So the reasons people are looking for work or staying at jobs or thinking about leaving do differ by demographics. So you can see on the left that, you know, Gen Z and millennials, that younger workforce, the workforce that's entering the market really are driven by purpose. A lot of times they want growth opportunities. They want to give back to the companies that they work for. And on the other side of that, we have baby boomers who really are still driven by money. I'll show you later in a couple slides that money is still king of the hill. But interesting to know that as newer workers come, you know, into into the workspace, that there are motivations beyond money that do top the charts. 
the other thing I will say up here is across the board, you know, coming in at an equal two for both demographics and those in between is this drive to have, you know, better wellness programs, better mental health, better work-life balance. And I know those are words we'll talk a little bit more about again, but I think that is a trend that emerged after COVID and the pandemic that I do not see going away. And we can see a lot of companies putting great programming in place, you know, to, to answer this for their employees, whether it's paid days off to go volunteer or yoga, you know, virtually or in the office, depending on what your work style is today. So just in another important notation as people look to what they're investing in to retain their employees as we move ahead. So next slide, the good news is, you know, although there is this fluidity, although people are moving around, you know, we, are, we have jumped up where two of every three job seekers are currently optimistic and satisfied in what we're doing. So I think that's an important, you know, distinction. People can be happy, but still look. So I think that makes us as employers have to think about two things, how to tap into that happiness and have our finger on the pulse of how our employees are feeling, but also be realistic that one out of every three, you know, isn't really necessarily that happy and is out there looking. So while not directly correlated or linked or mutually exclusive, there is certainly a crossover between satisfaction, how people are feeling, but is that going to stop them from looking or not is really what we have, you know, in 2023 to look at. So the next slide um, I want to talk about, we talked about generational differences, but across the board, if we took all of our survey takers together in one bucket, I wanted to call out here really what those motivations are for people looking for a new job. And again, remember, it could be a new job at a current company or a new company. Um, so again, 62% are seeking that higher salary. Money still talks. Flexible schedule, number two. And I'll talk more about it because there's a lot of words people use out there between hybrid, remote, flexibility. Each honestly do mean very different things at times, but are very blurred. But however we want to talk about it or define it for ourselves, it is the number two thing folks say they would look for um, in terms of what they want for job satisfaction. 46% want better benefits. We'll talk a little bit more about that. 40% um, want the ability to work remotely, so having those options. And then, as I said earlier, specifically, and most importantly for the newer generation, people want career advancement. So if we go ahead, I'm going to get into this concept of flexible, remote, hybrid. And I know, Timothy, you might have a comment here, too, on some of the research that you have done. But, but we do know that people want this. So, you know, remote is obviously working full time, off site, in your house, in a shared space. And we have seen that when people do put this on their, their job descriptions or their job postings, we do see more apply. So remote is very popular. It's certainly a popular sentiment that job seekers think they want or actually do want in some cases. So something to keep in mind. Flexible is obviously a quite different thing. It could be, you know, having flexible schedules, um, you know, doing shared schedules, having people pick their own shifts, um, working as an independent contractor. A lot of us obviously play in that space, but that allows people this, this term of flexibility. So definitely something that I don't see leaving the headlines. It will be interesting how this pans out in 2023 as more employers are asking folks to come back and either a flexible or full-time work model. But Timothy, I know you had a couple of stats too that you wanted to share from your side to kind of support this thought. Oh yeah, absolutely. Just just that in our, our temp worker survey, um, the the remote work was was near the top of, of, of things that, that temp workers um, Found, found critical in a position, and I think that's due to, to maybe parents with, with children or, or, or other caregivers where, where that flexibility is key. And really, when the, you know, the, when the pandemic hit, it was, it was amazing how, um, you know, office clerical jobs, finance and accounting jobs, and um, many of these jobs very quickly um, uh, transferred uh, to remote, and that, that was true of the temp workers as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I will say not one size fits all. I think how employers approach flexible work, remote work very much differs based on industry, performance of a given company, the type of workers are in those companies, um, the ability to even do that. We'll talk about in a few slides if that isn't even an option 
What are some of the alternatives? I know I read a survey today about marketing professionals in particular. You know, that's obviously something I relate to, that only 4% of those folks ever wanted to leave a fully remote situation. So again, lots of factors to figure out what your right option is um, in handling this particular situation, but definitely one that's still relevant. So that leads us um, to talk a little bit more about a deeper dive about how people feel about it. So we know they want it, but just a couple little stats here that, you know, 69% of people feel more positive if they're able to work remote, um, while 79% say it's a necessity. And again, we'll talk more about who particular is saying that. But before we do that, I think the next slide allows us to hear from you all on how your company is handling the situation. So you can see on the right hand side of the slide, you're able to kind of comment, is your company remote hybrid or on site now? Give people a couple minutes. And Timothy, I can't necessarily see the results, so I'll defer to you if you are able to. Yeah, and, and I guess, Kristen, you're asking about sort of the internal staff at, at staffing firms, not correct. Staff, correct. Workers, Your company. Right? Yes. Well, let's see here. Um, looking to see if there's something that will show the clear percentages here. I think what we're seeing is that um, hybrid is coming out to be uh, the most. It looks like about uh, a third. Interesting. And um, next followed by uh, remote and then on-site um, would be the smallest category. Excellent. Well, super interesting. Um, I probably could have guessed that. I think where there's two extremes, most people will probably land in the middle. But again, you know, not one size does fit all in this particular topic. And I think it's just important to have your finger on the pulse of, you know, what your competitors are doing, what your industry is doing, what your employee sentiments are. But again, a topic I'm sure we'll visit several times throughout 2023. But if we uh, move to the next slide, just a little bit of a deeper dive on, on the topic in terms of how people feel. So, you know, sentiments towards remote work are happiness, obviously, productivity. We hear a lot about less commute times, um, being able to be online much earlier, much later, having that flexibility. Um, we did hear something in our survey that said people would like um, to work remotely at least three days a week. So how that looks um, will be an interesting thing to unfold. 28% want to work remotely full time. And then millennials, this is the one I referenced earlier, a little alarming, or I should say definitely a headline to look at, but they say they would quit if they couldn't work remote. So food for thought as you figure out your policies um, for returning back to work. But if you move towards the next slide, um, I want to talk about what you could do if just this isn't a possibility for you. So we put three, you know, examples up here of different roles that really tend to not have that option to work remote or have a hybrid situation. That does not mean they cannot have flexibility. However, we've seen, you know, in some of these situations, many things that are allowing people to feel, you know, what flexibility is. I mentioned a couple earlier, but you know, flexible, flexible start times, flexible end times, you know, sharing of schedules, allowing folks to pick their own shifts online, making them feel like they're controlling their destiny a little bit more. Job sharing, um, mom programs where two moms or two dads or two whoever kind of share the one job to get the job done and have flexibility. So I put this up here because I think it's just important to note there are other drivers to making uh, job seekers and employees feel like they have a pulse on the control of their careers. And there's definitely programming people get creative with around many of the things that's important to them to have a more well-rounded, flexible feeling um, set of benefits and offerings for, for all you know, walks of life as it relates to employees. So the next slide, um, I just want to talk a little bit about money. We said money still talks. It's still, you know, king of the hill, no doubt about it. Um, and if we go one slide more, it brings us to our second poll. So 
there's a there's a stat in here about percentage of annual increases and in what employees actually thought um, very confidently they would get going into 2023. And that was a 5% raise to stay in line with inflation. Um, so the question for you all is what percentage annual increase do you expect um, to give um, or do you think your employees are expecting as you go into this year? We'll give a couple minutes for that. about 30 seconds left. So again, the question is, you know, as an employer, you know, where do you think your employees' sentiments are falling in terms of an annual increase? About five seconds left. Okay. Um, thanks to those that have responded. Um, it's a little tricky for me to see the results here, but it's it's fairly spread out across four choices. Um, and it, it looks like um, actually C is slightly the winner, three to four percent. I see that as well. See that as well. Excellent. Well, certainly something uh, to think about as we enter that season of, of merit increases in, in those cycles. But a little bit further, just talking about money. You know, money means many things to many people, but, you know, some of the deeper stats behind the questions that we asked is 66% of working adults prefer pay over anything else, including pay time off, which always ranked prior as number two before this remote work entered the picture. 47% um, appreciate a good salary most about their current job. 50% again, express confidence that the rise in wages will keep up with inflation, inflation, which is that 5% increase in the fourth bubble here. And then 67% of millennials um, have to work more than one job to make ends meet. This also is not surprising considering you know, the gig economy, how people have approached work, the ability to work multiple jobs um, you know, in the evenings, in the mornings, where you kind of define your own destiny. I think the Ubers of the world, you know, brought flexibility to the forefront. So this younger generation, certainly the generation, you know, we want to keep our eye on as they age into the workforce, um, do tend to have, you know, more than one job at times to, to afford the lifestyle that they're leading. So last, I just want to cover off on two quick things and we'll open it up for questions. Um, but, you know, as we said earlier, job seekers are on the move. We talked about some of the generational differences, but I just wanted to pull out here a few more stats um, for you all. And, you know, first we're going to start with, you know, what it is that gets people um, to want to be on money, you know, stay with a company. And obviously job security is way up there. That flexibility comes in again opportunity to work remotely. But the two or three I want to call out here that I think are really, really interesting and allows for employers of all kind to, to think a little bit is training and skills, skills growth potential is huge and it is rising in terms of what's important to job seekers. Again, I talked earlier about this concept of, you know, skills-based matching and the ability to open up a larger pool of jobs for, for people based on what they're good at, not necessarily just what they did. People are looking for ways to, to you know, climb and get better experience. Company's reputation, this is huge. So especially we know this with the younger generation, they do their research before they go work for companies, before they recommend a friend to a company. So the reputation of, of our companies online from Glassdoor to all of the other, you know, review platforms is incredibly important to people and should absolutely be a strategy of companies. And then really the mission and vision of a company, you know, we've come very far from the time where people went to a website to read the, the company's mission and vision. Instead, now they're going to their Instagram pages, their Facebook pages, their LinkedIn, their, their reading and sentiments of the employees to understand what is the vision of the company? What is the mission? Do they really live it? So that is an incredibly important um, thing that is rising in this and a huge opportunity, I think, for employers as they start to frame out how they're going to communicate, you know, their 2023 goals and missions. Um, I think the last two or three slides, I just wanted to very quickly point out what keeps people in a position. Um, I don't have to, to call out the first two, 
but um, do you want to make note that people are staying because they're happy in what they're doing, um, but that they also like their manager. So that is another thing. People like to work for people. They like to work for someone that they respect, learn from, mentor from, grow under. So very important, the dynamic between um, supervisors and workers um, in the workforce. And then on the last slide, I believe, I wanted to kind of tie it off with diversity and inclusion. You know, this is absolutely becoming a huge driver for candidates. We know that candidates, you know, look at the, the leadership teams on websites before they take jobs. We know that this is critical from a job seeker perspective that companies have internal diversity and inclusion initiatives, but also external ones in terms of how they hire, where they hire from. Um, incredibly big topic that I know that CareBuilder in particular is super passionate about. We have a huge partnership with the Black Information Network, um, something I'm personally very proud of, but initiatives like that, you know, to reach new audiences that maybe are underserved are incredibly important, I think, to workers um, when they learn about a company and research a company. So I did want to land there. Um, I know I talk fast, so I apologize, but I did want to leave it open for a couple, you know, important questions that you guys might have. And uh, we can end on the takeaway slide. Yeah, thank you, Kristen. That was fantastic. A lot to think about. Um, so a, a few takeaways from what we've shared in, in this webinar. Um, uh, you know, number one, um, the, the, the economy is a little bit slower at the start of this year, but um, some, some decent chances that it will accelerate. Um, and as we talked about, there's this, this interesting trade-off between kind of the short term and the long term. If, if things are, um, you know, maybe worse in the short term, maybe that's better uh, in, the, in the long term because um, the interest rates won't stay as high for as long. So it, it's kind of hard to know um, maybe, maybe what's better when you're thinking of short term and long term. Uh, secular growth drivers of staffing are, are very much alive. Um, some of those trends of, of people wanting to work more, more independently, um, you know, digitization, um, uh, you know, re retiring baby boomers, uh, creating shortages of, of workers, uh, you know, even beyond the economic cycle, some of these things um, are very bullish for staffing. And then, uh, you know, from Kristen's section, uh, you know, candidates are open to changing jobs. I think some of that survey data was pretty encouraging about active and, and passive job seekers. Um, they're, they're still still out there. Uh, the importance of flexibility. I, I love that statistic, Kristen, about the 51% the of millennials will, will, will quit if they, if they can't work remotely. So that, that certainly drives home uh, that, that point. Uh, and then certainly uh, diversity, um, equity, inclusion is something that we're hearing from, from uh, many corners of the market as well. Um, so uh, with that, if you have any questions, please type those in uh, to the Q&A uh, chat. We do have a few minutes here. And uh, I see that there are um, a few questions here. Um, someone asked about the slides. Yes, that those will be. You'll get an email in the next uh, 48 hours and uh, with, with a recording and, and the slides. Um, we have a question about uh, um, candidates. Uh, the candidate, the question is about uh, remote versus hybrid, I think. Uh, most clients uh, want hybrid but the candidates want fully remote. Um, any, any thoughts on that, uh, Kristen or Torsten? Kristen. Torsten, uh, you might have an opinion. I covered a lot of it, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, so, well, I think your survey is outstanding. So maybe, maybe, maybe if you want to talk about what, what you've been seeing in the numbers and also seeing elsewhere, and you see a lot of the anecdotes from your daily work, yeah, like I said, we've seen when the word remote, and I think we actually need to merge all three and have a new term, right, in 2023, because there is some blurred lines between them. But we know that when that word remote is put in a job posting, it will get um, seven times more applications we've seen than if it doesn't. So I think of hybrid as more of a model where it might be two days on, two days off. Um, and these are my days and my team comes in on these days and this is the expectation where I think of flexible more like 
I might have an expectation to go in the office four days a week, but I can be fluid with when I come in and when I leave. If I have a doctor's appointment in the middle of the day, I can make that up at night. So this ability to get the job done on my own kind of terms is where I lean more towards the flexibility. So I agree, employers are wanting more of a reliable pattern of people being in the office and getting a lot of the gains around that from productivities and teams being together, sales organizations feeding off each other. So it will be a balance, I think, and it will be interesting, you know, how even those words, I think, emerge um, for sure. And again, not one size does not fit all. And, and we've seen that as well. We've seen some industries five days a week, some will never go back. So it'll be interesting, um, you know, as we look back in a year from now, if there's some trends and patterns that we can pull out. Yeah, I think it's a fascinating tug of, tug of war. You see it in the headlines, right, where large companies are trying to force their workers back. So I think things will end up in the middle. And, and you know, staffing firms can play a, a role as a mediator at trying to convince a flexibility uh, from the clients or from the candidates. Uh, they can play that, that brokering role. Okay, so another question, I think this will go to you, uh, Kristen, about um, candidate engagement trends into the next year or two, you've, you've shared a little bit about, you know, kind of a snapshot of now, but but what do you see playing out in, in 2023? So I think candidates are, and or employees are very engaged when they feel like they are part of the mission of the company. They feel like their work is contributing to that. So clear goals that companies put out, clear contributions to that, I think, is a huge engagement factor. I really feel passionately about this concept of, of breaking those invisible barriers to easier work. So I'll give you an example. I think muscle memory has us all put four-year degree required for an administrative assistant when the reality is, is that really a requirement or should the requirement be amazing time management skills, can communicate with anyone, you know, juggles a hundred schedules. Those are many traits that a lot of people have that maybe have not had the benefit of a four-year degree. So do we look at work differently? to engage and embrace our employees who are already in our organization and maybe could be doing something more, something different, something they feel higher equity personally to do. So I think that is also a huge way to engage people. And my last answer would be employers are getting very creative with how they're engaging people through programming. Um, we've talked about the flexibility. We've seen a rise in sabbaticals. We've seen pet benefits come online for people. Pets are so popular right now. They're they're more important than a lot of things to a lot of people. So getting creative, I think, is important. And I think a good way to do that is sampling your employee base. What do they want? What do what would make them happy? It could even be food Fridays. Food does a lot of things for a lot of people we found. So I would keep that in mind as well. Okay, perfect, perfect. Well, we are running to the end of our time. I, I do want to thank Career Builder again, uh, a longtime sponsor and partner of, of these, uh, these webinars um, that SIA has been doing to the staffing firm community. Um, we will look forward to seeing many of you at Executive Forum coming up very soon, uh, March 6th through 9th uh, in Miami Beach. Um, there are links to some of the SIA research that, that we mentioned today. Uh, and uh, a huge thank you um, to Torsten for, for your wonderful insights and, and also Kristen, thank you for um, that, that data, very data rich presentation. So with that, uh, thank you again uh, for spending this last hour with us. Uh, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much.